A young award-winning Swedish journalist traveling the world is getting ready to pack up a move to China for the next chapter of her life. But before she leaves, she pursues an interview with a local engineer making headlines. What was meant to be an opportunity to further her career ended up being an opportunity for a predator instead. This, on today's episode of The Life They Stole. Kim Vall. Born on March 23, 1987, to a loving family in the small town of Trollberg, Sweden. She grew to be an intelligent and bright young woman that attended the London School of Economics, later graduating with a degree in international relations. Once completing her bachelor's, Kim, who was already known as a fantastic storyteller amongst her friends, realized she felt a deep passion for journalism which of course was not such a big surprise as both her parents had done their life's work in the same field. Following their footsteps, Kim moves to the U.S. in 2012 to pursue her master's in journalism and international affairs at Columbia University in New York City. Along with her studies, she began to learn Mandarin. After her previous internship at the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, Kim had found herself returning to the country again and again. She traveled to Beijing, falling in love with the city and the culture. Eventually, it became clear that Kim thought of China as a place that she would ultimately settle down. Meanwhile, Kim's diligent work and dedication earned her a scholarship from the Swedish America Foundation, a difficult scholarship to attain left for those portraying academic excellence and aptitude the young woman seemed to have more than a bright future ahead of her. Once graduating, Kim goes on to begin her successful freelance career, writing articles for reputable publications such as Time Magazine, South China Morning Post, New York Times, Vice, The Guardian, and many more. But it was the stories themselves that were the most impressive. Kim covered topics of social importance, Her articles centered around shedding light on matters such as corruption and exploitation in the smaller veins of the world. Sometimes her work led her to more dangerous locations, but the reward waiting at the end outweighed the risk. She knew some things just needed to be covered, such as her 2016 report on climate change and nuclear testing on the Marshall Islands, which earned Kim the Heinz Ometh Prize. A year later in 2017, just before Kim's dreams of living in Beijing full-time were about to come true, a rare opportunity arose. A local engineer was making headlines involving his privately owned space lab and submarines, which piqued Kim's interest. It was a great chance to get a good article in without having to travel far and interfere with her moving plans. And so she made contact and asked for an interview. Finally, just six days before the move, Kim gets a text she's been waiting for. She's been invited to the submarine, the Nautilus. Peter Madsen, born in January 1971 in Denmark. His life at home was noted to be somewhat turbulent, with his parents having a 36-year age gap. They split when Peter was just six years old, and he chose to live with his father, both sharing an interest in rockets. 
Young Peter would start to show an obsession with engineering. He was essentially self-taught and was building small functional rockets in his dad's workshop by the age of 15. And as Peter grew to be a young man, his passions for rockets grew with him. He began to network and would eventually be funded by organizations for projects, despite not having any formal education. His career started to really kick off in 2008 when he co-founded Copenhagen Suborbitals, a small private amateur space program. ride. Uh, we got to 60s. I could see it on the instrumentation. And uh, I choose to carry on up to 70s. And I was effectively reaching uh, my own limit because at that stage I was uh, losing my sight. Uh, first it got black and white. I got tunnel vision. And basically I was at the brink of G-Lock. So we've gotten right to the point today. But rockets were not Peter's only passion. He also built three submarines, UC-1 Freya, UC-2 Kraka, and the UC-3 Nautilus. At 58 feet or 17 meters, the Nautilus was the world's largest privately built submarine at the time. The project cost around $200,000, being mostly crowdfunded and built over the course of three years by Peter and a group of volunteers. Nautilus was able to carry four people submerged, but in 2017, Peter only had one guest on board. On August 10th, Kim received a text from Peter for an interview. He informed her to meet her at the Copenhagen dock at 7 p.m., about 30 minutes away from her home. Kim's boyfriend drops her off at the dock and expects to see her again in two hours. He snaps this picture of Kim before they take off. Two hours later at 9 p.m., when he goes down to the harbor at the agreed-upon time, Kim's boyfriend sees them nowhere in sight. At first, he remains patient. He understands there's no cell service underwater and that the interview may be taking longer than expected. But when minutes turn into hours, it became clear something was not right. Finally, at 1 a.m., Kim's boyfriend calls the police to report her missing. The authorities took the call seriously and act swiftly. Large search parties are dispatched, including helicopters and boats in the local area. At this time, the biggest fear for those looking for the missing submarine and the two people inside it is that there's been an accident. The man-made machine wasn't equipped with any navigation systems. There was no way of knowing where they were. The next day, at 11 a.m., 16 hours since Kim's boyfriend last saw her, the submarine would resurface, and it was sinking. As Nautilus was back on the surface for a moment, Peter was able to make a radio connection with responders and inform them of the current situation. He claimed a faulty ballast tank was to blame. A small private boat pulls up to the scene just as the sub was fully submerging for the last time. Peter swam over to the boat. Witnesses later report he was unnaturally relaxed for the given circumstances. And he was alone. Upon returning to the shore, Peter was quickly arrested. He was put on a 24-day hold on a charge of negligent homicide of Kim Vall since the submarine he was operating sank without the recovery of her body. The next day, the sub was lifted out of the water and was examined forensically. Inside, investigators found dried blood. However, no body was recovered from the Nautilus. No proof of Kim perishing. Peter has an explanation for his missing passenger. He claimed to have dropped Kim off at a local restaurant on the water at 10 p.m. the previous night. But when police checked all the CCTV footage in the area, she was nowhere to be seen. 
If the police were suspicious of Peter before, there was no doubt of foul play now. Peter changed his story quickly after. This time, an accident happened aboard the submarine. He claims Kim was hit on the head with a 155-pound or 70-kilogram hatch door to the sub, crushing her skull. Afterward, Peter buried her at sea. This was his story until 10 days later. On August 21st, 2017, a cyclist traveling Bayside discovers a dismembered torso, naked, with no limbs or head. It was found to have 15 stab wounds to the groin area. Two weeks later, divers, assisted by cadaver dogs, recover two plastic bags containing a head, limbs, clothing, saw, and a knife. These bags were found to be weighed down by heavy metal objects. DNA tests confirm the body parts belong to Kim Ball. I går øh, medførte det, at vi om formiddagen indledningsvis fandt en pose, hvor i vi fandt øh, Kim Balls tøj, trøje, nederdel, strømper og sko. I samme pose lå der en kniv, og der lå nogle blylodder til at holde posen nede. Omkring middagstid fandt vi først et ben, og så yderligere et ben, og kort tid derefter fandt vi et hoved, som også lå i en pose, øh, som var tynget ned af flere metalstykker. When all of Peter's electronics were seized, very telling pieces of evidence were recovered. On his mobile phone and laptop were discovered graphic and violent videos of decapitation and asphyxiation sex. It was even found that he had been viewing those disturbing videos just shortly before Kim boarded the Nautilus. As the head recovered from the ocean did not have any damage to align with Peter's explanation of what happened, his story changes for a third time. Now he was claiming Kim died of carbon monoxide poisoning while he was on the upper deck. He jumps down to her body below, but claims to see no signs of life. Peter says he tried to remove Kim's body from the sub for over an hour, but couldn't. So he dismembered her. He said he changed the story and lied out of respect to her family but the courts didn't believe a word he said. Based on the violent videos, the number of concentrated stab wounds to the torso, the blood found inside the submarine, and the bind markings on Kim's limbs, on January 16, 2018, Peter was charged with murder, indecent handling of a corpse, and sexual assault. His trial began on March 8 at Copenhagen Courthouse. Soon enough, a few other women came forward stating that Peter had invited them onto the submarine the week that Kim was killed. After six weeks of hearings, Peter Madsen was convicted of all three charges and sentenced to life imprisonment on April 25th. Psychiatric evaluation of the inventor described him as a narcissistic psychopath, completely lacking empathy. Peter immediately appealed the sentence, but without success. He now rots in prison. Kim was an incredible young woman that dedicated her life to making a change in the world. Today, she is still celebrated in helping other female reporters through the Kim Vol Memorial Fund giving the opportunity for bright female reporters to excel the way she did. There is this rebellion to Kim. The topics she covered, the rights she fought for, and the fact that the light of her soul will always outshine the darkness of the way her life ended. Kim Vol. Her life was stolen. But her legacy remains.
ville man hugga ner en stor vacker blodbok, alltså ett stort träd. Och Kim var väl ja, sex år gammal och sånt där. Och hon tyckte att det här trädet skulle få finnas kvar. Så hon och hennes kompis de skrev stora plakat att trädet skulle få lov att vara kvar. Och de lyssnade på de här sexåringarna och trädet finns fortfarande kvar idag, 25 år senare.